Welcome everybody to this Cancel RIMPAX webinar. We're going to start with a beautiful Cancel RIMPAC poem. In a world without RIMPAC, Papa will bear down smiling through the pain of birth, no longer afraid of losing her child to bombs. She will breathe and we will breathe, yeah. In a world without RIMPAC, there is breath enough to stand against the torpedoing teeth, the amphibious assaults, underwater explosions, the nuclear bombs and billions of dollars and bullets of peacetime that continue elsewhere. Breath enough to solve these and so many wounds, to sing so loud we drown all submarine sonar. In a world without war games on our watery blue body, there is no place for hungry egos, no place for triggering weapons into the belly of the rich, vast, blue Moana, because she will breathe free, freely, freedom, chanting, my body is not your playground. In a world without militarization, words like colonization and occupation become words used in the past tense. What possibilities emerge when we are free? Islands as space for creative growth and true security. The entire Pacific Ocean unafraid to breathe. In a world without nuclear warfare, Tahitian, Marshallese, Hawaiian, indigenous lives would be celebrated without hierarchy based on dollars and euros, without fear for our smallness or isolation, needing the protection of empire, unfurling a pandemic of radiation, contamination, and sickness. All lives would be created equal. In a world without deception, no one believes that security is a function of bullets. In a world without naval sonar, a song returns from the vast assembly of cerulean gods to an altar of coral and island anchored to this blue chorus from the depths of obscurity a tubulous melee from which we all do our living the source is stable Ola. in a world without war no child will bear a ballistic horizon only clouds skies waves will thunder in a world without appropriation, our language will be unstolen. Te mana, te kaha, rest from the crest of Her Majesty New Zealand ships of war. In a world without naval frigates, Eva traverses the Royal Moana Nui, the Star Command Blue Sky merging into the Navy Blue Pacific. Kiwa fishes for islands across the ultramarine hauling up Hawaii necessary respite. In a world without war, we wouldn't have to wonder if we'd wake to bombs being dropped on our villages, or question if our hanam was clean enough to drink, our golai safe enough to eat. No trespassing signs and fence lines wouldn't dictate the journeys of our tano and our tasi. We'd be islanders connecting through constellations and canoes, sitting under coconut trees, sharing origin stories, chewing kuba, round bodies dancing, islander hearts beating, ancestral dreams come true. In a world without bombs, we honor generations of Ike. We seed forests of koa. We stand in the malu of our sacred mountains, plant our ieve in the frigid waters. We stare back at Aina and see our reflections, kneel down and are fed in a world without bombs, we rise from the sea they tried to conquer. Ea, mai ke mai. In a world without militancy, silk breaths line her womb. Finally, she can breathe. Thank you very much to all those 13 Indigenous poets from Oceania.
from Hawaii, Aotearoa and Guam, who came together to write and record the poem to call for the cancellation of RIMPAC and for restoration of air, life, breath and sovereignty. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā kota katoa. And that uh, was created, directed, edited by Mikey Inui and also co-produced with Joy, who is joining us today. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. My name is Liz Remiswal, and I am with World Beyond War in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Ngāti Kaungunu land in Hiratonga. And uh, on behalf of us all, I'd like to acknowledge the whenua, the land on which we stand, the ancestors who have come before us, and those who are following on for us, and the deep respect for life that we share. Welcome to the Pacific Peace Network's contribution to the Cancel RIMPAC campaign. Once again, we need to stand up and demand that RIMPAC is cancelled. This, this is a coalition of members who come from uh, many countries around the Pacific, including Guam, Jeju Island, South Korea, Okinawa, Japan, Philippines, Northern Mariana Islands, Aotearoa, Australia, Hawaii, and the United States. RIMPAC is taking place in Hawaiian waters, run by the US Navy in up to 26 countries, and has been running biennially since 1971. We say it's a dangerous, provocative, and destructive naval war practice, and there is increasing pressure to get rid of it. So without further ado, um, we will start on our, our wonderful panel that we have here. And just to let you know that this is being recorded and that English closed captions are enabled. And you may submit questions in the chat box or can use the Zoom raise hand feature later on. So, um, and I'm going to hand over to our co-host, Kaya. Welcome, Kaya. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And uh, it's good to see everyone who is joining us today. Um, I will be introducing each of the speakers. First, we will hear from Tina Grandinetti joining from Hawaii. And she'll speak for 10 minutes. And the speakers from each of the other islands and uh, regions that are joining us will have five minutes each. So I will be letting people know about the timing as well as doing some introductions. My name is Kaya Verady and I'm living on Jeju Island in South Korea. And um, I'm happy to be joining you all today. So our first speaker, Tina Grandinetti was born and raised on Oahu and is a doctoral student at RMIT, uh, University Center for Urban Research. Her work focuses on the production of housing insecurity in Hawaii and the ways that Kanaka Maoli and working class settlers are resisting displacement. And she also manages the office of Hawaii State Representative Amy, Amy Peruso, where she is working to develop policies to strengthen tenants' rights and curb speculation in Hawaii's housing market. So thank you for joining, joining us, Tina. We look forward to hearing from you. Aloha. Well, I think that was a bit of an old bio. <laughs> um, uh, maybe more relevant to our discussion today. Um, I'm zooming in from Hawaii um, and I'm a member of Oahu Water Protectors, um, which is a 
coalition or a group that formed in response to the Navy's poisoning of our aquifer here on Oahu. I'm also a board member of Hawaii Peace and Justice, which is a organization committed to demilitarization in Hawaii and the Pacific. Um, uh, and was also a co-founding member of the Cancel Impact Coalition, um, which formed in 2020. Um, to try to stop RIMPAC from happening while we were in the midst of a pandemic um, and a uh, strict lockdown. Um, anyways, thank you so much for having me. I want to first introduce myself also as a Uchinanchu or Indigenous Okinawan woman, um, born and raised here in occupied Hawaii um, on Kanakamali lands. Um, to give you some background about what's happening as we speak here. Um, RIMPAC started um, this month and 26 nations, 38 ships, four submarines, more than 170 aircraft and 25,000 personnel are currently participating um, in war games here um, in the islands. Um, for people in here in Hawaii, like we experienced this as um, a moment of environmental crisis during RIMPAC, um, sink exercises, drop decommissioned ships into our ocean just offshore from the beaches that families play in and, um, and harvest fish from and limu seaweed. Um, Live fire training has set fires at Pohakuloa at the base of the sacred Mauna Kea, which is a focal point of Hawaiian cosmology. Um, and then, so every two years, RIMPAC has destroyed our island's resources while ve very much naturalizing the imperial violence and the settler colonial violence that um, is part of the ev everyday um, reality of living here in Hawaii. Um, but I really want to highlight too that for that this is more than just about the desecration of aina or land and by water in Hawaii. It's it's also making us complicit every day in imperialism and war making around the world. So our opposition here in Hawaii to RIMPAC is not just rooted in the immediate effects that it has on um, aina and the environment here, but also um, in the knowledge that we here in Hawaii play a very specific role in the projection of empire across the Pacific and, and around the world. So our opposition to RIMPAC is a way that Hawaii can confront this complicity and refuse this complicity and um, really assert our values as island people um, who believe in peace and aloha and refuse to play host to um, war and violence. Um, so we're really committed to transnational solidarity. It's not just about no RIMPAC here in Hawaii, it's about no RIMPAC anywhere, no war games anywhere, no war anywhere. Um, and so I guess I'll just kind of like give a rundown of what our resistance to RIMPAC has looked like um, over the last couple of years. Um, during the last RIMPAC in 2020, we were in the height of our lockdowns um, and, you know, also um, at the time, the UN was calling for a global ceasefire to really um, deal with the pandemic um, as a global community. And in that context, the uh, US Navy really like committed to RIMPAC. So we, that really highlighted the contradiction between this militarized sense, uh, militarized understanding of national security um, and, and what real safety and health and well-being means for our communities. So we formed um, the Council of Impact Coalition with amazing activists from around the Pacific. And um, we launched a public education campaign, a guerrilla art campaign. We held a convoy where we could protest RIMPAC um, while practicing social distance measures. 
Um, and we delivered, I think 13,000, uh, we delivered a petition with 13,000 signatures to our governor um, asking him to um, appeal to the military to call off RIMPAC. Um, this year, RIMPAC is taking place in the midst of another huge crisis, potentially one of the worst that we've, we've seen here on Oahu. Uh, in November of 2021, the Navy poisoned Honolulu's uh, most important aquifer, uh, which supplies drinking water for nearly all of Oahu. Um, and they still haven't um, shut down the fuel facility that was responsible for that for the fuel leak, um, which poisoned thousands of people um, and resulted in the loss of about one fifth of our water supply. Um, so um, instead of you know mobilizing every possible resource to shut down the fuel facility, clean up our aquifer, um, they have instead slow rolled us and then now have continued on with um, the RIMPAC exercises. Uh, one, of our, one of the leaders of the movement to shut down the Red Hill Fuel Facility, Wayne Tanaka, he says, it's like the Navy came to our house, started a kitchen fire and are now hosting a backyard barbecue while it continues to burn. Um, so, so I think like, Whereas in 2020, our response to RIMPAC really focused on like the contradiction between uh, the needs of our community during a pandemic. Now our, our response has really focused on the, the Navy's, the audacity of the Navy to poison an, uh, an entire island's drinking water supply and then act as though um, they have a right to then they have a right to ask any more of our community before making sure that we're safe. Um, and so I wanna share, this is not, I wasn't involved in, in this particular act of resistance, but one of the most significant and I think beautiful um, responses this year was that um, a organization called Ko'ohewai, which is a coalition of um, Hawaiian organizations that rose in defense of our water. Um, they built a ko'a, which is a ceremonial focal point that draws and multiplies abundance and health and resources and life um, at the doorstep of the command headquarters of the US Pacific Fleet. Um, they did this at the beginning of the um, of our drinking water crisis, but at, and a few months later when RIMPAC started, they um, hosted at the Koa and Anahulu, which is a, a 10 days of, you know, like ceremonial resistance where um, they set up camp um, and we gathered as a community to share food, political education, um, even had a concert. And so it was really, um, it was a, it was a moment where we could, sh we could combine these two, we could combine our critiques of RIMPAC and um, the like everyday poisoning of, of Aina in Hawaii. Um, and bring bring that resistance literally to the doorstep of the U.S. Navy. Um, that wrapped up last week, and it was, I think, just a really beautiful way of asserting a different world in which in which our community comes together to take care of ourselves. Um, in defense of Aina, but also in defense of each other, um, to say that we aloha each other um, and that we know we know that a world without we know what a world without RIMPAC could look like as we as we learned in that poem. We know it we because not just because we imagine it, but because we create pockets of it where, wherever we can, whenever we can be together. Um, sorry, that was. A little, a little scattered, um, but I hope that gives you a sense of um, what's happening here in Hawaii and how we hope we can stand in solidarity with you this year and every other year impact happens until it doesn't happen anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. And I'm sorry about the outdated introduction. 
And thank you also for keeping under the time. I will would like to invite um, Senator Jordan Steelejohn um, to be the next speaker. Um, he is an Australian federal green senator with portfolios, areas of responsibility in peace and nuclear disarmament, defense and veteran affairs, youth health and mental health. And um, thank you for joining us today. Let's see if I can find a way to pin. Thank you so much for, for inviting me uh, to, to today. Um, it's the uh, second time, I believe, that I've been part of, of one of these gatherings, and it, it's wonderful um, to, to be back uh, again. I just want to start off by, first of all, acknowledging that I'm um, zooming into this conversation from the unceded uh, lands of the uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri uh, people here in the Australian Capital Territory, uh, pay uh, respects to their elders past and present, and acknowledge that sovereignty over this land and was never ceded, um, as well as express my solidarity and the solidarity of the Australian Greens uh, with uh, the people uh, of Hawaii who are uh, once again being subjected to uh, the continual uh, iterations of colonisation and the impact of the reality of the 21st century's, um, the 21st century version of what we really need to clearly call out, I believe, as American imperialism. Um, and in some ways, what we are seeing in RINPAC and what we uh, will see in Talisman Sabre, which is uh, the equivalent exercise that takes place off uh, the coast of Australia, um, is really, in some ways, a, an imperial pageant. Um, coordinated by uh, the United States, um, not only to send a message to other nations and communities in the region, but also uh, to send a message to, uh, for want of another phrase, um, imperial populations within the empire's sphere of influence. It's as much for the Australian community and the Hawaiian uh, community, for instance, to be reminded of the power um, and majesty of American might as it is uh, for external nations and communities. And I think it is really important that we continue to gather um, across the globe to push back on those ideas, to call them out, and as Tina um, said so eloquently, to, to not only imagine a different world, but to create pockets of it, because it's in that those pockets that we are able to um, we are able to draw energy as community and activists together in the, for the for the continued campaign needed to to create a more peaceful um, and cooperative world, but also to remind ourselves um, in the fog of um, of the fight, if you like, in the fog of the uh, of the um, propaganda that comes out of these uh, entities that actually uh, alternatives are possible, they are real, um, they can be created. Um, here in Australia, as a member of the Australian Greens, we are just kind of coming back together after a federal election, which has seen a Conservative uh, government chucked out and uh, the most Greens ever elected to the Australian Parliament explicitly on a platform of the which included a, a significant reduction in military expenditure, a removal of Australia from the AUKUS pact, um, a removal of foreign bases from our uh, soil here in Australia, and uh, a uh, a renegotiation um, of the ANZUS Treaty, which has formed such a big part of our relationship uh, with the United States for so long. And as uh, peace and disarmament spokesperson, I, I found that really exciting um, and I'm really happy to have moved also into the foreign affairs uh, position for the Greens um, as well um, post the election. Um, the quick things I wanted to mention following on from what Tina uh, shared with us is, is I want to acknowledge the role that Australia, even though we have changed governments, uh, we are still planning and it is still the government's intention uh, to uh, 
position Australia as uh, the American outpost uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, there is a bipartisan commitment in uh, in Australia to massive military spending, about two hundred and seventy billion dollars over the next ten years, um, and to closer integration uh, with the United States, even as tension between uh, the US um, and uh, the People's Republic of China uh, continues to rise in the region. Um, and that is coupled, unfortunately, with a clear commitment from the new government to continue opening um, up fossil fuel projects, regardless of the fact that the burning of coal and gas is a key driver of climate change, which is the number one issue, particularly for Pacific Island nations um, of our region. Um, and it also has to be stated clearly, unfortunately, that the new government uh, is uh, fully committed to the AUKUS agreement, which is um, not only a threat to global peace, um, but is threatening to trigger, as Indonesia and Malaysia have said so clearly, um, a regional arms race for the acquisition of nuclear submarines um, in the Pacific and a clear violation um, of the South Pacific uh, Nuclear Free uh, Zone Treaty to which we are um, a party. The Australian Greens are uh, uh, totally opposed um, to all of these um, these proposals, projects and alliances. And over the next three years, um, I'm going to be working and I would hope to work with all of you to uh, to push back against these uh, frameworks, um, to chuck a lot of them in the bin, um, to see a significant reallocation of defence military uh, resources to addressing the underlying uh, causes of conflict um, and to build peace and transform uh, conflict, but also to rebuild an understanding of what do we mean when we talk about international relations um, and foreign affairs, which in itself is a word that I actually really feel uncomfortable with, this idea that um, having relationships across boundaries should be conceived as uh, foreign affairs is, is part of the problem, I think. Um, but we're really hoping to build and promote an alternative approach, which is grounded in anti-racism, which is grounded in feminism, which is grounded in First Nations approaches uh, to international relations and seeks to build collaboration, relationships, um, which are at the center um, of what is needed to build peace, um, not only in the Pacific and Pacific Island nations, but across the world as well. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to working with you all in that to achieve that goal. Um, and thanks so much for giving me a space to, uh, to, to talk with you. Thank you so much. Uh, it feels like five minutes is a very short time, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I hope that we can then have good questions and answer time afterwards. So thank you, uh, Jordan. Our next speaker will be Sunhee Choi. Uh, she's a peace activist who has joined the struggle against the Jeju Naval Base since 2010. She's a member of Gangjung International Team, Gangjung Peace Network, Inter-Island Solidarity for Peace of the Sea, and people making Jeju a demilitarized peace island, as well as being a South Korean advisory board member for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Uh, so welcome to Sunhee. Thank you. Um, okay. Hello, this is Sunny Choi from Gangjung Village, Jeju, Korea. I am honored to join this very important webinar and am grateful to all the organizers. On May 31st, three warships left the Jeju Navy base located in the Gangjung Village to join the RIMPAC. The South Korean base was built in 2016 and serves for the US domination located in the strategic spot. The three warships included an amphibious assault ship named the Marado, which joined the Olympic for the first time. The other ships are an Aegis destroyer and destroyer. The, they later joined the uh, Shindorsov, a submarine. 
it is not only ships. South Korea also sent around 1,000 military personnel, including one company of the Marine Corps amphibious force, four teams of naval special wartime flotilla, one P3 maritime surveillance aircraft, and two rings multiple naval helicopters, along with nine amphibious assault vehicles and mobile construction squadron. The three warships did not directly go to go for the Hawaii, but conducted the US ROK war drill of Okinawa from June to fall, provoking North Korea to launch eight short range missiles to the East Sea of the Korean Peninsula the next day. The ships will also join the Pacific Dragon 2020, 22, a missile detection and tracking war drill of Hawaii from August 1 to 14 after the impact also joined by Australia, Japan, United States, and possibly Canada also. This year, South Korea sent the largest contingent ever, and her military power joining this year's impact is the second, next to the United States. And noticeably, South Korea commands an expeditionary strike group formed of certain warships from eight nations, a thousand marines from nine nations, in this year's impact, you could see South Korea's nine amphibious assault vehicles running on the beach of Hawaii, which contributed to the destruction of lives such as Honu or Turtle. South Korea and United States Marines especially had the South Korea Red Expeditionary Advanced Base Operation, U.S. military's new operation concept. This drill is still in the test stage, even in the United States. It is the operation to secure a kind of a bridgehead before reclaiming their islands taken away by the enemy. What does all that mean? South Korea, now the sixth military power, is a linchpin for the United States domination strategy. The strength of the South Korean United States Japan alliance would be critical for the United States to complete the global alliance along with NATO. And this year, South Korea, a NATO partnership country, joined the summit meeting for the first time uh, in NATO summit meeting. And Yoon suk the new right-wing president, had a summit meeting with Japan and the United States during the NATO summit meeting. On May 5th, under ex-president Moon, South Korea became the first Asian country to join the NATO Cyber Defense Group. It is important to note that the Korean War has never technically ended. To decrease all the military tension in Northeast Asia and world, ending the Korean War and concluding the peace agreement will be a critical step. Another thing to pay attention is uh, the impact is the chance for South Korea for arms export. After the disaster on the Peruvian ship Bekai's Corvot on July 17th, some South Korean media concerned its possible bad influence on arms export as the ship was originally, originally transferred from South Korea. So we are here. On June 22nd, there was a press conference in front of the Jeju Navy base. 20 civic groups signed the joint statement in opposition to the impact. People wore handmade hats, which symbolized various lives who would be killed by the Korean war drill. On the sea, people carried out sea protests. The people in Jeju will never give up on shutting down the Jeju Navy base. It is our great joy and responsibility to join all the peace-loving people in the world to save the earth from wars. Let's decolonize our islands and regions. Thank you. Here are resources so that you can further look at. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sanhi. And I would like to next introduce Hank Rumbewas from West Papua, a West Papuan human rights activist who is joining us today. 
I got a very short bio from you, but hopefully you can fill it in and share more with us all. Welcome and thank you for joining, Hank. Uh, greetings from uh, the people of West Papua. Uh, my name is Hank. Uh, it's originated from Dutch name, which is Hendrik, the shortened as Hank. So the background is West Papua is a former Dutch colony. Uh, so of the island of New Guinea. Uh, it's very, uh, I, I think if you look at the map, I don't have the graphic here, but it's the, the island of New Guinea is the second uh, largest island in the world after Greenland. Now, um, the topic I'm, I'd like to share with you, uh, when I was listening to our indigenous brothers and sisters from Hawaii and also Korea, there are so many issues regarding the uh, indigenous people. I'm sitting here in the land of Larakia, the Aboriginal people of Australia, uh, and watching of the ongoing problem in uh, Croatia, I feel like West Papua is an issue that nobody wants to know, um, but it's strongly related to the enforcement of Australia, the land where I am now living in exile, but also uh, the war that, which is going on in Croatia at the moment, the enforcement of the president of Indonesia, Jokowi, recently trying to bridge between Putin and also uh, the president of Croatia, the hypocrisy of uh, how Indonesia is trying to be a middleman between uh, uh, Croatia and, and not Croatia, Ukraine, Ukraine, I'm sorry, uh, and the Russians. But Indonesia committed its crime by taking over uh, West Papua in 1963. The most, uh, the immediate issue that now we have in West Papua is we have the presence of more than 100,000 Indonesian personals. And the island of uh, New Guinea, which is West Papua, we have two, only two uh, million people, but now they are carving it into five districts lately. So the migrants from Indonesia are now settling into West Papua by force. Uh, so the probability would be about 4 million moving in. So which means we are going to be a minority in the, only in a very short period of time. So the last, in the last two weeks, uh, the indigenous people in the mountain area, the mountains area in particular, they are attacking our uh, new settlers from Indonesia. Uh, the last two weeks, which is sad, because the uh, indigenous people murder some Indonesian civilians. So, so far, the military operation, there has been 17 operations since 1981 around the uh, mountain ranges, and we got the highest mountain with the permanent snow. So, many, many of our uh, indigenous people who are now made maintaining the struggle. Uh, luckily, the rainforest protect them, but we feel sad. We feel sad because around the mountains ranges, we got the biggest gold world uh, in the world. And this is the biggest problem because Freeport, the copper, uh, gold mine is operating there. The interest of America is very strong. And that's how I could say that uh, I could share with you that we look at the war, the real war that we experienced, Biak Island, that's where I originally come from, uh, is the, one of the islands where MacArthur uh, stated, uh, I mean, at the station before going to Guam and going, uh, coming down to Australia, uh, what you call as a jumping frog. So Biak is what they call the dynamo of uh, the Second World War. And it reminds me of the ongoing war. Now, Darwin, that, that's where I live. 
the American base is now opening and it's getting bigger and bigger. So Guam and now Darwin and Hawaii and Korea. I don't know what I'm going to do, uh, share with you, but I would like to say thank you that you are giving me this opportunity to share with you. There are so many issues that now we are facing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we are dying, our people are dying down, only a matter of time. In the next coming 10 years will be minority our own home, homeland. And there are 260 million of, the, the, that's the population of Indonesia. And so for us, the two or three million people doesn't mean anything to us and will be coming minority like the Aboriginal people of Australia. And Papua is treated exactly similar to what Australia did to our indigenous people here, that it's a no man's land. Uh, West Papua is considered, or oh, we are considered be, not to be human being, but we face racism in many cases. So I'm sorry I didn't have any figure or uh, a picture of West Papua of what I'm talking about, but thank you for giving me the five minutes to share with our brother and sister across the Pacific, the people of Hawaii, New Zealand, and also Aboriginal people in Australia, and our brothers and sisters in Korea and anywhere else. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think we can all see how the Indonesian military training and RIMPAC is very much connected with what's happening in West Papua. And I hope people will uh, look up more if they need to find West Papua on a map and learn more about the struggle of the people there. Our next speaker today is Moneka Flores. Nick from Guahan. She's a member of Rutehi Lutekjan, Lutekjan um, Save Rutidian, a community organization dedicated to the protection of natural and cultural resources in Guam or Guahan, specifically those located in sites identified for US military live fire training. They oppose the establishment of any military firing range and stand in solidarity with groups in the Northern Marianas and in Okinawa. And so I'm happy to welcome Nick uh, to be our next speaker. Thank you, Kaya and Sainamasi to all the previous speakers. Um, it's an honor to stand in solidarity with all of you. And, um, you know, I'm extremely moved by the words of our previous speakers. Uh, Hank, uh, it's good to see you again. And, um, you know, the last time I saw you was at a decolonization conference here in Guam before the pandemic. And um, it just really makes me think about all the things we as Pacific peoples are struggling against, you know, and how all of these things are connected issues of empire, of colonization, of racism, of climate change, of deep sea mining, everything that's so vulnerable to us who have lived in the ocean for thousands of years um, and who have a sacred relationship, who have cultivated our sacred relationships with the ocean, with our Tasi, with our Moana. And uh, we know how vulnerable our waters, lands, and sacred sites are. Um, Guahan is one of the oldest settlements in the Pacific and also the longest, one of the longest colonized. And we are constantly pushing back against the empire. And so I really wanna thank the previous speakers um, for really you know, sharing all of the struggles that they're involved with and, and really uh, illuminating all the ways our struggles are connected. I um, have been ex also extremely moved by seeing the actions in Hawaii and Jeju Island uh, to try to cancel RIMPAC. Um, and, and, you know, as Tina said, we, we just have to keep doing this until there's, there's no more RIMPAC. And, RIMPAC, sorry, I'm a little choked up uh, there. But um, I, I, I am a descendant of the indigenous Chamorro people who've lived in the Marianas Islands. Um, or Lagos Zangani for over 3,500 years. And as I said, you know, we've cultivated a sacred relationship with the ocean, but also we have a long legacy of, of uh, environmental racism resulting from US colonization and militarization. 
and our people continue to suffer several ongoing harms, um, including indigenous and human rights violations at the hands of the United States government and military. And um, we are currently in fighting a lot of these unresolved in injustices, you know, including our decolonization, which has been stalled for over 123 years. Um, some of the harms we face include massive land seizures, cultural erasure and oppression. Um, um, the land seizures are being taken from military bases and, and illnesses resulting from devastating military contamination. Right now, Guam has 19 Superfund sites and 70 toxic sites, sites so, so heavily, ha so hazardous, so heavily contaminated that they require you know, long-term cleanup and, and far from being remedied any from, you know, any of these harms from being remedied, we, we have this massive military expansion happening right now. And that has brought about, you know, the clearing of 1,219 acres of limestone forests and the construction of a live fire training range complex on um, sites that are sacred to us, but also right over our Northern Lens aquifer. And that uh, firing range will bring about, you know, um, it's th this, this expansion means like the exploitation of an additional 1.2 million gallons of water a day out of the aquifer and the firing of, of about 70, 7 million ammunitions a year over the aquifer. And um, our island is constantly impacted by war games like RIMPACT. RIMPACT. God, I need to calm down. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're constantly affected by war games like RIMPAC. Right before RIMPAC, we had Valiant Shield here. And these violent military exercises defile our sacred oceans and harm our sovereignty in all ways, our political, environmental, economic, cultural, and spiritual sovereignty. And, um, you know, leading up to RIMPAC, we saw um, several ships carrying, uh, coming through here, carrier strike groups, including Abraham Lincoln, the Ronald Reagan. We saw um, the BRP Antonio Luna from the Philippines that came through here. Um, we saw um, a lot of uh, several, several um, um, advanced, uh, advanced units, uh, really. And we also, and this was connected also to the first exercise in Palau. Um, that just happened recently, but just a couple of weeks ago, our island was flooded with claims that now China is having the largest military um, buildup in the Pacific, and, and we know that that's not true. Um, this is rhetoric. This is propaganda that's constantly pushed to get uh, pushed up upon us that we are threats of a missile attack from China um, in order to justify these violent war games in our lands and waters and also um, the continued, um, the increase of, of the US military presence in the region. And so, you know, um, there's, it's going to be, it's, it's really, it's gonna take a lot uh, for all of us to overcome empire. You know, it, it, it feels like in so many ways, war has never left all of our homelands, you know, and uh, whether it's war that happened here in Guahan or in Hawaii, in Korea, um, and, and, and everywhere in the, in the Pacific. Um, and just looking at the horrible videos, you know, of, of all of the um, tests and bombing and all the aircraft over the ocean that's just right off the coast of Hawaii right now is really, it, it's, it's infuriating. Um, this, this, this posturing is just it's just a waste of, of resources that can that can go um, to protect uh, our environment and also provide genuine security for humanity. And so um, it's an honor to stand in solidarity with all of you today to cancel RIMPAC. I just want to um, say that it's so important, you know, while all of our lives are impacted by war and our planet is, is, is being destroyed as we speak because of war, it's so important to center the voices of the indigenous peoples of these lands and, and uplift the, the voices of these indigenous peoples and see, you know, for, for those of you who are listening, who are our allies, you know, if you could think about the ways to, to, um, to, to support us in our fight for sovereignty and peace in our homelands, because we all deserve it. Uh, Sana Masi and thank you so much. Thank you so much. <sighs> There's so much happening these days in Wuhan with more of the militarization uh, that's shocking to hear every time. Uh, as well as in places like um, Okinawa and Miyako Island, our next speaker will be Yuichi Kamoshita, who is a Buddhist monk living in Okinawa. 
Um, he's worried about the future of Okinawa and says, we should search for a future unique to Okinawa that does not depend on the economy of the United States or mainland Japan. And I uh, think he'll be joining us today from Miyako Island. So I hope to hear a little bit about the situation there as well. Thank you for joining us, Kamoshito-san. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so in the beginning, uh, I want to share my Buddhist prayer. Namu myo ho renge kyo. Namu myo ho renge kyo. Namu myo ho renge kyo. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yuichi Kamoshita. Uh, speaking from island of Miyako in Okinawa. At first, I need to explain that I'm not originally from Okinawa. Why I mentioned this? Uh, because Okinawa wasn't a part of Japan before. The people in Okinawa used to have their royal government. The United Nations recognized Okinawa people as an indigenous people. So I am speaking as a Japanese who live in Okinawa. I express my solidarity with us protecting people in Hawaii. Our Japanese naval ships and army joined RIMPAC, exercising the launching missiles. They think China as a hypothetical enemy. And I owe an apology that people from my land harming your islands and water. Now we are separated dots on, on this earth, on the different islands. But I believe uh, these different dots will be connected and the united power of us will overcome the militarism. So about Okinawa, uh, I have been putting my energy to stop mining soils from the national park of the Battle of Okinawa, where uh, still remains of war victims are in and on the land. Uh, Ministry of Defense made a plan to use the soil from Southern Okinawa for Henoko New Base land reclamation. For the Okinawa tradition, ancestors remain. It's so important. There is a ceremony called Senkotsu, which means watching ancestors remain after a few years from the death and again uh, put in a grave. Uh, bereaved family says, don't kill twice. And another issue, uh, in Okinawa Island, 50% uh, of the land is being occupied by US military today. Of course, there are countless uh, contamination problems in Okinawa. But today, I want to mention about PFAS contamination. I don't explain what is the PFAS contamination this time, but today I want to tell you why military contamination in Okinawa is so devastating. Uh, it is uh, because of the US-Japan Status of Forces Agreement. The agreement was concluded between Japan and the US. Okinawa wasn't in a negotiation, table, even this agreement affects so much into Okinawan society. This is also against the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, in the end, I have to express my concern about the possibility of the military conflict between China and Taiwan. In Japan, after the Russia's invasion to Ukraine, people's opinion for military expansion is higher than before. 
uh, rewriting or changing the Article 9 of Japanese constitution is also advancing. Ankisti and the fear lead people's mind to militarize. And we have been opening the solidarity for inter-island camp for peace before the corona pandemic. Uh, I feel we need restart the peace camp for more solidarity between the islands who suffer from the militarism. I would like to invite all of you here for the coming peace camp likely happening in Okinawa, the island called Miyako, where I am now. The Miyako unit of Japan, Japanese Defense Force joining RIMPAC. So we can make more impact than RIMPAC. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that Kamujita-san is currently doing a peace march opposing the militarization happening there on Miyako Island now and hope to join there uh, when there can be a peace camp in the future. Our next speaker will be Emmeline Oliviano from the Philippines. Uh, Emmeline is the spokesperson of the Cebu chapter of Kilusan para sa Hambansan Democracia, Movement for National Democracy. Hope I didn't pronounce it too wrong. Uh, it's an anti-imperialist and democratic movement in the Philippines. And she's based in Cebu. So I will invite next our speaker, Emmeline. And I see the speaker after that is Anne and Anne has her hand raised. Um, so maybe hopefully our original order would be to uh, hear from Emmeline first and then from Anne. I hope that's all right, Anne. Um, I could send you a direct message. And go ahead, Emmeline. Um, thank you for joining us today. Hi, uh, good morning from, from the point of view of the Filipinos. And it is um, an honor to be here joining you as one of the panelists of um, this Pacific Peace Network webinar. And uh, please know that we in the Philippines are with you and elsewhere uh, in the calling out of the uh, cancellation of RIMPAC uh, and please also know that we uh, do feel the same way, uh, given that Filipinos have been a neo-colony and at the same time a base of um, intense militarization of the U.S. in the Pacific. So I am here to share with you in representation of two organizations about the perspective and at the same time expressing our solidarity to the Hawaiian people and to everyone advocating for peace and against war. Uh, we know that the impacts um, uh, resulting from this, as far as neocolonialization, militarization, we felt it with you affecting in various um, um, situations like um, alienation. Um, uh, in, in our case, it is also violence uh, against women and children, and at the same time, further marginalization. So here, uh, we intend to uh, substantiate, uh, substantiate uh, the facts, uh, what has been also uh, done here in the Philippines in relation to the RIMPAC. So yes, um, Naik was right. Um, this uh, year in June, uh, the Philippine Navy officers sent off from the former U.S. Naval base in Subic, the frigate FF Antonio Luna and other uh, Filipino participants to the RIMPAC. This is actually the third time the Philippines is participating. Um, according to the newly installed Navy Chief uh, Vice Admiral Adi Luis Bordado, uh, he said in a statement that the Philippines Navy's participation this year resonates, and I quote him, with the orientation of the Philippines Navy's intention to raise the level of its involvement in international defense and national engagements. This should be spine chilling for Filipinos who understand what that means. Uh, RIMPAC and the other US-led military exercises are war exercises, 
presently geared against what the U.S. considers as its primary challenger, our neighbor China. That means our own soldiers and our country are getting even more involved in the U.S.'s preparations for a war that would surely make life in our region more difficult and very likely devastate our own country. And I should say further devastate our own country. But after 75 years of getting schooled under U.S. military officers and additionally under Australia's and having been continuously, though wrongly told that the U.S. took us under his wings, uh, its wings, most armed forces of the Philippines officers speak as if U.S.'s security interests are our security interests. Uh, you observe how the Philippine Navy um, chief parroted the Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. in his statement that the Philippine Navy is steadily seeking to engage more like-minded partners to contribute to a stable and peaceful maritime space in the Indo-Pacific region. Well, his sentence, we're more capable now, simply means we're more ready to do our master's bidding. Yes, the Philippines is more capable to do so as asked by the U.S. because by magnifying the so-called China threat, U.S. agents have ensured that the Philippines' assertion of national sovereignty is strongest when it is against the operation of China's vessels in the South China Sea and could barely be a whimper against patrols and exercises of U.S.'s warships in the same sea the U.S. has been treating its own and even in the inline waters in the Philippine archipelago. And yes, the US can better make use of its alliance with the Philippines after US Defense Secretary Austin's visit made President uh, Rodrigo Duterte withdraw his letter terminating the VFA before, of course, the installation of the newly President Marcos. Uh, after security meetings, they euphemism euphemistically described as mutual or bilateral within the last quarter of last year, agreed to increase the number of joint U.S.-Philippines military activities from 180 to 300 and expand areas allowed for the U.S. forces to use as forward operating bases and cooperative security locations. The U.S. is speedingly setting the stage for more Philippine involvement as a U.S. ally. The U.S. Coast Guard is very much present. You would sometimes wonder if our coast coastline have become U.S. territory. The U.S. has a bi-laboratory, a zoonetic disease laboratory in Cagayan, built by the Threat Reduction Agency of the U.S. Department of Defense, while the Philippine government keeps mum about it. Even after the U.S. military turned over the bases, it still has reserved areas in Subic and Clark exclusively for U.S.'s military use. Additionally, however, the U.S. has a naval facility in Subic now, American companies, Cerberus Capital Management and Aguila NY Naval Incorporated, they call now Angel South, Aguila South Incorporated, have now taken over the strategic expanse, formerly Hanjin Shipyard and call it Aguila Subic. The Philippine Navy is at hand to protect it by occupying as a tenant 250 acres for its naval operating base. Vectrus, a global service solutions provider to the US government and across the world, offering facility and base operations, supply chain and logistics services, information technology, mission support, and engineering and digital integration services is the other tenant. The Philippine ambassador to the US, meanwhile, Jose Manuel Romualdez, no less said that the negotiations for the acquisition of the former Hanjin shipyard centered on how the former biggest US naval base in the Pacific could provide a docking and repair facility for US ships. So with more joint exercises with facilities and war equipment in Philippine camps, forts, or bases, the U.S. troops are here every day. The U.S. is ready to use the country now against its perceived enemy. So you might be wondering, do the people know in the Philippines, do Filipinos really consent? Surely we do not want to be another Ukraine. Hence, uh, we stand by with all of you in the campaign against the cancellation of RIMPAC and persist we must for the world is ours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing so much information in short amounts of time. Our final speaker today will be Anne Pakoa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
um, who is joining us from Vanuatu. She's been having some uh, poor internet connection, but I hope that she is back with us now. Okay. Um, so I hope the internet connection stays strong so we can hear more from Anne. Anne is an experienced human rights defender, education policy analyst, registered nurse and nurse educator who is driven by a passion to fight for social justice. She takes pride in providing equitable services to the people of Vanuatu, in particular, the poor and most vulnerable. As the founder and CEO of the Vanuatu Human Rights Coalition, uh, she's doing training and producing human rights uh, defenders. So I am happy to welcome Anne. Hopefully, Anne is able Hello. to- Okay, can you hear me? Hi, yes. everyone. Welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. I am going to make this very short because I, I don't trust my internet connections. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Annette and uh, the rest of the team for inviting me to be part of today's um, speaker. Um, I have been given the extension to speak on behalf of uh, Vanuatu by our honorable leader of opposition. Um, Honourable um, Member of Parliament, Ralph Breckenvanu. So your excellencies, honorable leaders, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the warm introduction and welcome. I speak on behalf of my fellow countrymen and women to say no to RIMPAC. Today, we joined the Pacific Peace Network to raise a united and strong voice against the US the USA largest military training exercises happening now in Hawaii and Talisman Sabre in Australia. Our beautiful Vanuatu has been rated three times the happiest place on earth because of its unique piece of culture or culture of peace. We cultivate peace through our cultural and religious values. Our systems are embedded deeply with our land and our beautiful ocean. This is because our land and ocean are both our inheritances. I speak on behalf of the traditional custodians of our land and see to say no to RIMPAC. As a state, we know very well and we do not know guns and wars. Our generations before us have never known guns and wars. This generation does not know guns and wars. Our conflicts are not caused by weapons and therefore our generations are not familiar with these exercises. In the history of the Pacific War resulted in the state of confusion, dislocation of people and disruption of society. In particular, we've seen that in the Solomon Islands through the Ramsay, the Ramsay. In the history of Hiroshima War, there's a lot of conflicts and a lot of people are still being victimized by result of that Russian, um, of that weaponry war that happened both in Japan, but also affected the Pacific Ocean. In the history of the Pacific, we also read about how the US has tested its weaponry um, weapons in the Marshall Islands which still affects the livelihoods of women and children until today. The Pacific Islands such as Hawaii and Tasman Sabri in Australia are not and cannot be used as testing grounds for weaponry testings. Our land and the Pacific, the beautiful Pacific Ocean cannot be used as US military testing grounds. We know very well that the impact of these exercises will surely harden and make more difficult the livelihoods of our people, especially our women and children whose lives are dependent on our natural resources. 
the sound and physical activities of RIMPAC will impact and will affect our land and sea. It will definitely affect the psychological and the social well being of our people. RIMPAC activities are a violation of the most fundamental human right, the right to life. The UNSCR 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security also affirms further the resolution of the UN member states of the protection of women. As a country, Vanuatu affirms this resolution on October 27th, 2020. And therefore, as a state, we strongly argue that the US will need to back off RIMPAC activities from Hawaii and Talisman Sabra Australia simply because of our strong international relationships with Australia and Hawaii. We strongly stand against RIMPAC and therefore in solidarity, we join the PPN network. We say no to RIMPAC. Your excellencies, honorable leaders, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that our voice is loud and clear. Please, I wish to extend this advocacy to the rest of the Pacific Island civil society organizations, the rest of the faith-based organizations that we will continue to stand and say no to RIMPAC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, and so wonderful that you've been able to beam in to us from Vanuatu despite the internet. Um, it's incredible the amount of solidarity um, here today, especially from all the different islands, very much common themes. So now as we have a little bit of time for questions, and there's a, a question here about solidarity and collaboration, how we can advance, advance that. And um, Annette says that the Red Hill fuel contamination and the PFAS contaminations are examples of how military activities have so many environmental impacts. And they should also connect us to those who are working for climate justice as well. So um, the, this question is to all of the speakers. Any ideas on how we can advance that collaboration and that solidarity? Please, if you have got an idea, please share it from our speakers. I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be the speaker, either, but although I see Anne's got her hand up now, but I think it's a question that probably any of the participants could, could express their views on, but uh, good to see Anne has got her hand up. Yes. Um, yeah, I think uh, PPN is a great platform that we could all come together to amplify our voices. Um, yes, we need to fight against um, issues of colonization. And Pacific, for example, is standing against um, uh, colonization and decolonization is one of our biggest, biggest interests. And therefore, I do believe that with the PPN, if we all join together and continue these meetings and momentums, I think we can make this one of the biggest advocacy platform um, yeah, that, that's just for me. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So the, um, Diana and Sung He have their hands up. So uh, Diana, have you got a an answer there for us? Can you unmute, please? Aunt Diana, can you unmute, please? Diana, you need to unmute, please. Diana. Um, yeah, just try and unmute, unmute again, because you were unmuted. 
Oh, Last two. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, it yes. keeps muting me, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it's not neutering me, at least. But um, I, I live in Darwin. I've lived in Darwin for um, uh, nearly 50 years. On and off, I do go other places. But, um, yeah, we have almost consistent military exercises up here. Uh, it is getting worse. They are talking about bases, apart from having like a dry season base. So it, it is having, a, I, I put in several complaints on called the serial complainant up here to the military, et cetera. But um, I don't mind that. And I talked to one of the complaints officers up here who does agree that we need peace. He has children, we need peace. But this is where they stand with the government. And unfortunately, as our Greens representative said, that um, our new government is carrying on the tradition of um, the Morrison government. So yeah, that is unfortunate. What do I see as an answer? True consultation and for any group. And it means keeping things simple so that we're not um, excluding anybody. And I mean, I had a decent talk with our you know, military complaints officer and um, yeah, we can include people. So it, it's keeping language and sentiments and everything balanced. And that's probably one of the strongest answers that I can think of as an activist for many, many years. <clears throat> and maybe a lot more if we can, if COVID allows forums, et cetera. You know, we can socially isolate in that sort of uh, context. I find it really hard nowadays to actually get uh, younger people, especially um, activists. But uh, again, can I say humour is a huge uh, thing as well, that uh, if you use sort of humour that um, is not damaging, but you know, often when people are not communicating because they're unsure of anything, a, a little bit of down to earth humour does help. But um, I'll, I'll head back to the, the true consultation, listening to people. You know, I've worked on many Indigenous communities up here over the years and worked with Indigenous people. And um, it, it's the listening that's important in all ways for everybody. And um, they're not doing it and they never have. You know, we've had Conservative governments as well as Labor governments saying, um, oh, we're listening. But no, they're, they're blank. And it's, um, so it's actually involving people more in this. And probably in our own gentle way, can I say, fellow pacifists, that, that um, we put a few more kind of um, teaching instruction kind of um, impact in there that makes them listen <laughs> to us. But, okay, that's, that's what I have to offer. Thank you. That's very helpful. And thanks for all the work you've done. Over to you, Nate. Okay, but did Sung Hee want to answer first? I think yeah. Sung Hee. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Alexa, yeah. please, Sung Hee. Yeah. yeah. Um, these days, uh, with the people uh, uh, in Jeju uh, are shouting slogans of cancel impact uh, during the weekdays, every day, from Monday to, you know, the Saturday in front of Jeju Navy base, you know, the courage also uh, with me. Um, what I find out is that uh, the media environment is really harsh, you know, the, uh, the against us. Most media just announce the, you know, the how, you know, the, the Olympic is grandiose. And then there are little uh, articles about, uh, you know, the opposition uh, to the Olympic. So, you know, our voice, our connection is a, like an air to decolonize our earth. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, 
the settle the issue of the climate justice. So what we are doing is very important uh, given the, the media environment. What I also find out is that uh, this kind of a webinar is a great chance for people to uh, educate uh, one another because we can feel uh, we are connected as one. And it, this is really important, especially when the language is different. You know, the, what uh, I always uh, you know, feel sorry is that how I can share this kind of very important information uh, shared here uh, can be also shared with my Korean friends. Uh, but uh, uh, I'll do my best uh, so that uh, my Korean friends uh, can, you know, the really feel that uh, we are all one. And then, yes, it is really important that we uh, feel each other's pain, suffering, and then our connection. I'll do my best. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Sunghi. Uh, so yeah, I would like to talk a little bit about how collaboration and solidarity can be advanced and you know, um, just in a reflection of what Diane was saying earlier about needing to listen more. And um, it's definitely true, but I, I also wanted to say that sometimes, you know, although we're all peace activists, sometimes gentle approaches are, are difficult to maintain because we're all living in a sense of urgency. We're all living in a, or we're all living in a state of urgency rather. We're all living in a state where there are so many things that are vulnerable. And when you really look at, you know, the Hawaii Islands, Jeju Island, the Marianas Islands, we're talking, um, you know, Okinawa, we're talking about islands that are carrying a tremendous burden, you know, that have um, had to be resilient to so much violence and desecration and destruction. And so an idea of balanced perspective is something that's that's a little hard to achieve and, and, and also maybe a little problematic because you're talking about people that have been historically exploited and erased. And, and something this is something that we experience every single day, you know, living in our homelands. And so um, one of the ways I think I would like to suggest that folks, you know, consider um, for advancing collaboration and solidarity is, you know, think about the ways you can use your power because especially as settlers, especially as white settlers, there is some privilege and power that um, us indigenous folks do not have, you know, because of our colonial histories. And so please think about ways you can use your power, talk to your leaders. Um, and we live in a capitalist reality. So maybe you can think about ways to use your resources to help raise funds, to support the work of indigenous folks and also help us get media attention. Those are all great ways to help to help us, I mean, you know, um, and and like soon he said, this is a space to to get that kind of conversation going, right? To get the to to help us get these make these points so that we can address, I mean, the you know the institutionalized racism and white supremacy that's a part of all of this injustice. Uh, there's so many there's so many things we're fighting for and fighting against, and so yeah, please just consider the ways you can use your power to to aid in, in this struggle. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Very timely, important reminder to us all. Okay, we've only got a few minutes left now and um, we would like to invite you to, to sign our Cancel RIMPAC statement and our petition, which um, will be put in the chat shortly. And I'd like to hand over to Joy just to sum up and for some conclusion remarks. Thank you, Joy. Aloha. Aloha mai uh, My name is Joy Inamoto and I am Kanaka Maoli living in uh, on Oahu in the middle of Rimpak. Um, I would like, I know that uh, me and, and Tina together would love to thank our allies, um, Songhi, Hank, Nick, Yuichi, uh, Emmeline, and Anne, um, for their solidarity, their love and compassion for us in Hawaii. Uh, 
We would also like to apologize that these games that take place in Hawaii have such a detrimental impact on your islands and in those places. What we have seen from all the speakers, what we've heard from all the speakers is that RIMPAC and uh, Talisman Saber and Pacific Dragon and whatever name they give, whatever romantic name they give to war games is an embodied violence for us that we have been living with for centuries. And we need each other and must demand that we fight for each other and show up for each other every single time. And when I think of our, our Wontoks in uh, the South Pacific, uh, Vanuatu, who doesn't even have to, who isn't even part of RIMPAC reaching out to us, but knowing that it is still impacted by US, by US military buildup, by Australian military buildup, by New Zealand military buildup, uh, by Canadian military buildup, all of the impacts. When we think about the impacts to our Wontok in uh, West Papua, we in Hawaii have nothing but love and solidarity and consistently stand up for West Papua whenever we can. And so we thank you for taking the time to, to um, stand up with us against RIMPAC. We know the direct impact that the Indonesian soldiers being trained in Hawaii consistently has on your islands. And we demand the end to the genocide that is happening there. Uh, the need for us, not just solidarity. Solidarity is a word. Uh, we need alliance building. We need strategy. We need organizing. We need to come together. And, and to, to sum up uh, what some of what uh, Yuichi had said uh, is that we, we need to seek these economies that are not reliant on war. Like to, we need to in these pageants, right? We need, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And I missed uh, Senator, uh, John, Senator Jordan. Uh, um, we need to end these pageants of imperialism. We know that this is posturing, right? We know that this is a posturing that we pay the price for while they poison our waters. The audacity of any Navy or any military to threaten our aquifers and be so callous with our lives. And this isn't just including our lives, but the lives of their own military, they take, they do not take seriously here in Hawaii, right? They poisoned the majority of people that were poisoned by jet fuel in the water were military families. They are not concerned with life. So when we understand that they are on a mission to kill us, our solidarity is much more clear. Those lines are, are absolutely ever present. And when we think about your positionality, what you can do, where you can step back, where you can intervene, where you can move, all in the ways to restore our self-determination, right? And for us to determine the use of our lands and our waters, that is what US and Australian and military occupation means for us. We have been denied the right to determine what happens to our coastlines, what happens to our fish, what happens to our mountains. And that is what everyone in this room is calling for, a much, much deeper thing than solidarity, an alliance building, an organizing, a stepping forward and not turning our backs on each other. And when we come together in that way, we will win because the empire is crumbling. And that is what all this posturing is about, a failing empire that is doing its last attempts to find, to find yellow perils where there are none. And so I, I wanna just close that by saying um, mahalo nui loa once again, uh, please consider signing uh, the, the Council for Impact Statement um, and, and look to us to, and, I, and also if folks are interested, there is a, an online Council RIMPAC uh, exhibition 
that is being hosted by Young Solwara Pacific. Uh, dot com. It's a youngsawarapacific.com. And uh, you can see artists from around the Pacific and around the world protesting RIMPAC uh, through video and poetry and visual arts and song. So mahalo. And I'll hand it back over to you, Kaya, or Liz. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Thank you so much. Very, very well said. And I mean, it's just, it's just heartbreaking what is what is happening in these beautiful waters and these islands. So um, thanks again, everybody who's taken part today, all our wonderful speakers, and also a big thanks to David Swanson, Executive Director from World Beyond War, who's been doing the tech today. Thank you. It's quite late in Virginia. And to Kaya, co-host, and also um, Annette Brownlee, who is part of the Pacific Peace Network and other members of the Pacific Peace Network, who um, have brought this together today. And this is just a challenge today. This is a start of, of how we can actually move on from here. So, so please keep in touch with us and, and onwards. Thank you. Tina koto, Tina koto, Tina koto katoa. <laughs>